Okay, so for today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, aerobatics and specifically the uh, introduction to aerobatics and, this, and basically how it applies for the non-competitive uh, type. If you do want to compete in aerobatics, this is how you would get into it anyway. Um, so for anybody that's interested or ever thought about doing aerobatics, um, if you would want to find out what aerobatics can do to help you as a pilot in general, even if you don't want to go and do lots of... Uh, anything too extremely exciting in the airplane. Um, so uh, some of the things we're going to cover today, um, we're just going to go through, so, you know, why fly aerobatics? Why do you, you know, how's it going to help you? And actually go through those details in different ways that you can apply aerobatics in different ways to improve your ability. Uh, go through the rules and regulations, cover those. Uh, and uh, we're going to get into some of the different characteristics of the training itself and, and some of the fundamentals, stalls, spins, coordination, that type of stuff to talk about how we train differently than your standard training, what we do differently that is more toward an aerobatic theme, but how we take that to a different level to help you uh, increase your ability in flying the aircraft. We'll go through the physiological effects, basically the effects on a person flying aerobatics. Obviously, it's not your normal flying, so you're going to experience some different effects. And we'll go through some of the uh, safety procedures, uh, you know, the use of parachutes, and uh, we'll go through some of the different um, maneuvers, the basic maneuvers to kind of show you what's out there. So um, why fly aerobatics? Um, first off, what is aerobatics? The official definition from Webster is that it's a difficult and exciting uh, movement of an airplane often performed for entertainment. That's the, the standard textbook definition of aerobatics. <coughs> or, Roy's, <laughs> or Roy's landings, yeah. Um, <coughs> The FAA definition uh, is a little slightly different. Uh, it's any intentional mover, maneuver involving an abrupt change uh, in, in your attitude. So any pitch roll, uh, any abrupt change uh, that's not necessary for flight. Okay. Uh, note that uh, not necessary for normal flight. So um, that's kind of a pretty loose definition like most FAA definitions. So we'll get into that a little more. My definition of aerobatics is that it's a stick and rudder skill which enables the pilot to safely and efficiently control the aircraft through its uh, entire flight envelope. Okay, And that's to me is, is the, why I fly aerobatics and why I think most pilots get into aerobatics on a recreational level is that it's, it's there to develop your skill, um, you know, obviously have some fun with it, but primarily learn to, learn to fly your aircraft to its full range capabilities. Not that you're going to do that all the time, but that you have the capability and capacity to do it when you need to. So, uh, particularly, we're going to be learning about uh, a couple different things. And the first thing you'll notice when you do the training is that we're going to be focusing on increasing your coordination, your ability to fly the aircraft, your stick and rudder skills, okay? Uh, which would include your timing, controllability of the aircraft, um, putting the aircraft in any particular attitude you need to at any particular time, uh, at any particular rate of speed. So. Um, to be able to bank the aircraft into a particular bank angle and do it efficiently and quickly, okay? Um, pitch the aircraft on final, you know, uh, it'll, it would translate to your basic traffic pattern primarily. I mean, just the ability to bring it around on final and line up with the runway quickly and efficiently instead of wandering and kind of floating around, fighting the wind, uh, you can just nail it, you know? And that's that's very important, especially if you have a kind of a gusty, uh, strong wind. Um, that extra controllability of the aircraft, you're confidence in that would help you tremendously. Uh, overcome the fear of it. You know, a lot of people are a little nervous about doing aerobatics. Uh, and uh, it doesn't help that, uh, you know, the media portrays it in a certain light. Um, the accidents that you reported, it was the guy who was out horsing around and crashed. You know, there's a lot of things that, uh, that give us a bad impression of aerobatics. But uh, really, aerobatics is, is a very gentle form of, of flying if you really look at the basics of it. It's not extreme. It's not this hard flying, crazy, wild, out of control thing that it's looked, that it's kind of demonstrated to be, especially at like an air show event. At, at an air show, their whole point is to entertain you. Okay, back to our first definition. That's to entertain people nowadays because they've seen an aircraft go upside down. That's not that exciting. So now that we have to do it 10 times faster, 10 times harder, with smoke and, you know, big bangs and flashes and stuff to get people's attention to, to create that entertainment. So that uh, is not what we teach. It's not what we do. Uh, our, the recreational aerobatics is very gentle, very smooth. 
It's about building your ability to fly the aircraft smoothly and precisely. So um, build your confidence again in flying and, of course, being safe. And uh, that's the other major application to recreational aviatics is your ability to uh, know your aircraft. And in the event of any unusual situation, an emergency situation, uh, you would have the ability to control the aircraft in such a way that you can get out of that bad situation very quickly. You can respond to the, to the emergency effectively rather than being along for the ride like your average pilot. Um, there's a lot of accidents that you'll read about where the pilot lost control of the aircraft. Now, I don't know, aside from you know losing a wing or losing a major control surface on the aircraft, how you lose control of an aircraft. And if you read all the accident reports that involve lose, loss of control, um, you know, 99% of them, there's nothing majorly wrong with the aircraft. The pilot, it was the pilot's inability to fly the airplane. That says a lot about, you know, the, the average pilot out there. I mean, that, that's kind of scary when you consider that they lost control of the aircraft. They're trained to fly that airplane, but yet they lost control. So this is going to help you. Um, you'll see a picture here of uh, Chuck Yeager and Bob Hoover. And those names hopefully are slightly familiar to you. Um, and the reason I put a picture up here of these two, um, back in the 50s and 60s when these guys were flying in their heyday, um, they were, you know, some of the top pilots uh, in the U.S. Air Force, and they were some of the top test pilots, particularly. And in my opinion, these guys are the epitome of, of what I say, fly the airplane. These guys knew what that meant, and they did an awesome job at it. Um, the reason they became so successful in their career as test pilots and uh, Bob Hoover later on as an air show pilot was the fact that they knew fundamentally how to fly an airplane no matter what. And that's what made them great. It wasn't any special ability. It was just the fact they knew how to fly that airplane really, really well, uh, better, than, better than most. And that ability to understand the, the extreme flight envelope of the aircraft and, you know, what's it going to do when we're in this attitude, this position, this speed, that's what allowed them to be very good test pilots. So when they went out and experienced a new situation, they had a lot of good experience to go off of in, in unusual situations and then could adapt that to their current situation to save their butt and land the airplane, you know, in that test pilot scenario. So um, they're kind of, I think, very good role models for, the, for a pilot, you know, learning to just fly the airplane and, and develop those basic skills. And uh, Bob Hoover uh, had a quote that he was known for saying, and it was... Uh, he would always just tell people, fly the thing. Just fly the thing. That was his famous line. You know, if, they, if you want some advice from Bob Hoover, he'd just say, fly the thing. You know, and it's so simple, but that's the, that's the whole point. So um, now let's talk about some regulations. Uh, go through what the FAA actually classifies. We've already got their definition of aerobatics. Um, but basically, your aerobatic flight rules, um, you're not allowed to operate an aircraft uh, over any congested area of a city, town, or settlement. Okay, so not over the middle of the town, uh, not over an open air assembly of persons, not over, you know, the football game, doing aerobatics right on top of that. And uh, you cannot perform aerobatics within the lateral boundaries of any class B, C, D, uh, or uh, controlled, E controlled to the surface airspace. Okay, so uh, class G uh, or class, uh, uh, well, class E controlled, uh, which We'll get into that in more detail, but um, but your Class G airspace, your uncontrolled airspace, and um, of course, you, we have our airways. I don't know if everybody here is not everybody here is instrument rate, rated, but um, but uh, within four nautical miles of the center line of any airway, that's obviously a congested area. We're going to have a lot of traffic flying. It's a dedicated path for those aircraft to travel. So, therefore, uh, we want to avoid flying near those. Finally, the last, uh, well, I'm going to skip the skip E, but F, uh, when the flight visibility is less than three statute miles, that's just kind of a common sense thing. I don't know many guys that go out when the flight visibility is less than three miles in general to be flying, but especially if we're doing things that require extreme attention to our, our horizon, our area around us, um, you know, we want to have good visibility. But uh, E, item E, blown altitude to 1,500 feet above the surface. Uh, this is the minimum rule from the FAA. Okay, so around here we're roughly a thousand feet above sea level, so that's going to put us at 2,500 foot MSL as our as our base. That's our floor. Okay, uh, not ground level anymore. We now have a, a buffer floor of 2,500 feet MSL. Um, that's the 
FAA minimum. That should not be your starting minimum when you're performing aerobatics. When we do our training, we uh, always start out anywhere between five and 6,000 feet MSL, okay? Um, our minimum, we hit 4,000 feet. We're breaking off what we're doing. We're going back up, regaining altitude. Um, so, you know, give yourself a good safety margin. Don't just do the minimum required. <coughs> Personal rules. Um, is these are more important, in my opinion, than the, the published rules. Um, number one, you are in control of the aircraft. When you're doing flight training with the instructor, you're in charge. And don't ever forget that. This goes whether you're doing touch and goes or you're doing aerobatics. If you want to do one more loop, ask the instructor if you can do one more. If you don't want to do one more loop, tell him you don't want to do one more. You don't have to do it just because the instructor tells you to. If you don't feel comfortable performing a particular maneuver, you don't have to. Um, so make sure you have very good communication with your instructor and what you're doing, but remember you are in control and, uh, and you're there to learn. So therefore the instructor expects you to fly the aircraft. Um, if the instructor is flying the airplane the whole time, you're just along for the ride. You're not learning anything. So it's about you, you developing hands-on skills. Um, also never perform aerobatics, um, when you're not operating at normal. Now, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? As far as, you know, it's, it's, this is more of a personal, and you'll notice, I'm sure, uh, you'll notice the I'm safe there behind it, okay? The uh, illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue. Um, basically, when you're not up to par, if you're feeling sick, if you're kind of ticked off about something that happened yesterday, it's not a good time to go fly your aircraft at an extreme uh, part of its flight envelope. So just keep that in mind. And take your time and set realistic goals. Uh, I have a lot of guys that call up and want to do aerobatics. And uh, they're really excited to get in and get started, and that's great. And they think we're going to go up, and an hour later, they're going to be doing loops and rolls and all sorts of fun things. And uh, that's just not the case. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do. And again, if you'll notice, my, the theme of so far in this presentation is that it's about building skills. It's not about, really, it's not about doing the loops and the rolls, the upside down stuff. It's about building your, your skill and your ability to fly that aircraft. As a result of you increasing your skill and ability, you'll find that you can do a loop and a roll quite easily. They're not hard maneuvers, but it's, it's after you've developed that skill. So really the first thing we're going to be working on is your basic stick and rudder skills, coordination. Um, you know, a mandatory for me for doing uh, aerobatics is you have to do spin training uh, before you start aerobatic training. And uh, preferably uh, that uh, you have a tail endorsement, number one. Uh, we're going to be flying in tail aircraft. Um, there are aircraft that are aerobatic, they're non-tailwheel, but Typically, your, your preferred aerobatic aircraft are all tailwheel. So um, know your limits as much as your aircraft. That's uh, just hopefully you keep hearing that from many, many people. That, that's always an, uh, important. So talking about the aircraft a little bit, um, specifically, we we're talking about that tailwheel airplane. This is our Satabri that we train with here. And basically, uh, what makes an aircraft aerobatic is is basically the way it's designed. It's not particularly about the horsepower. It's not about how big the wing is or how many wings it has or the size or the shape. It's, a, it's kind of a combination of everything of the overall design of the aircraft. So a couple of things that, that help make an aircraft aerobatic, that make it more aerobatic than, a, than another aircraft, as you'll see here, is larger control surfaces. That aids in, in uh, better controllability of the aircraft, especially at slow speeds. When you're taking the aircraft through a particular set of maneuvers, you can be going from a speed range of 140 mile an hour to 40 mile an hour. And so you want to be able to have controllability at both extremes of the flight envelope. So larger control surfaces, such as the large rudder, large ailerons, help with that. The other thing that helps <coughs> is a combination of the power and thrust. Uh, if you've been to an air show recently, you'll see that everybody that performs has excessive power and excessive thrust. That's because to make a good show, to do the most extreme things, that power and thrust is really what helps you out. It's not a requirement of aerobatics. It doesn't make an aircraft aerobatic just because it has a 300-horse engine. Uh, this particular aircraft, the Satabra, has 150 horse, and it'll perform aerobatics just fine. It's, it's uh, it, you know, the, the, the power is not, is not the, the key thing. Really what, above all else, of all these things that you see here, what really helps the most is the pilot. The pilot is what makes an aircraft aerobatic, okay? Um, if you read a few stories on Bob Hoover, uh, 
um, you'll find out that he actually, uh, um, every, every aircraft he ever flew, he barrel rolled that aircraft on takeoff <laughs> after, after takeoff, almost immediately after takeoff. Um, and I mean, every aircraft he ever flew aircraft that were not supposedly aerobatic aircraft that had not been flight tested yet, uh, for such maneuvers. Uh, he got himself in a, in trouble, uh, not with the aircraft, but with, um, with the higher ups in the military, uh, by doing these things, but, but he got away with it, but he, he knew he could do that because he knew the fundamentals on how to fly an aircraft. You know how to fly it quite well. What do we have, uh, visiting us? Black Hawk. Uh, they're coming in to learn about aerobatics as well. So, yeah. All right. <coughs> they like to come over here. Um, so I want to compare just uh, another aircraft to my Satabri. This aircraft here you'll see is the uh, known as the Oracle Challenger. Uh, it's basically the aircraft flown. It's a unique aircraft, one of a kind, built specifically for Sean Tucker. He's, a, he's currently the top, today's top air show performer, one of the top performers. And he's known for his wild, gyroscopic, out-of-control air show routine. Um, the aircraft was built specifically for that. And the reason that I can't go out and do this wild, gyroscopic, out-of-control uh, air show routine is, as we'll show here, that although I have large control surfaces, he does as well. So I, I, we have the same comparison there. Okay, So I, he has very large control surfaces compared to the fuselage, compared to the uh, stabilizers and, and such. But you'll notice that he has eight ailerons. Okay, the, the, it is a full span aileron, the entire wing, tip to tip, and uh, they're actually hinged halfway down, so he actually has a set of eight, and uh, that allows him to do lots of extra things. Um, basically, he can use the outboard ailerons first, and if that's enough, he doesn't need to add the inner ailerons. They won't come up. The, fir the outer ones will come up first. The, s the inboard ailerons will then come up uh, second, only when, he, when he's particularly slow and needs the extra roll rate capability. That way, he's not getting the extra drag off of the second ailerons when he doesn't need them out there going up and down. And that basically allows him an excessive roll rate, and it allows him to, to be able to rotate the aircraft at incredibly slow speeds when he's doing gyroscopic maneuvers to remain, con remain in control. So uh, that's one unique thing. The other thing is, you'll notice that Max gross weight of the Satabri is 1,650 pounds, and his is 1,200 pounds, okay? So to compare the weight, and then we'll compare the power. I have 150, he has 400 horse. I weigh more, he weighs less. So power to weight ratio and uh, just your, your, your thrust output, you know, to, to your weight, you know, is uh, incredibly different. He can basically stand on the end of the prop and hang it on the prop. Um, I can too for about... Mm, two seconds and then I stall and fall. So uh, that's just, a, you know, that's the extremes of, of the aircraft and, and the differences between them. That's what makes him capable of doing what he's doing. But nonetheless, both aircraft are still considered aerobatic and they can still perform the same fundamental maneuvers. So a little bit about, uh, we talked about stall spins, coordination, and uh, what we want to learn as we're developing our, our abilities and flying the aircraft we want to learn to fly the aircraft at its extreme extremes of the envelope and that means stalls slow flight that that end of the spectrum it means spins and everything else so you'll notice in the picture here um, we have an aircraft that is stalled out and in one picture it's nose up and the other picture it's nose down an aircraft can stall in any attitude it can stall in a nose high attitude or a nose down attitude um, the top picture in the nose down attitude, that's not typically taught in your primary uh, textbooks. Uh, why, I don't know. It should be uh, because it's, it's very, very important. Um, our job as the pilot is to do basically two things. And the number one thing we're supposed to do is not stall the airplane. Do not stall the airplane. If you don't stall the airplane, you really, that, that eliminates half your problem right there. Okay. And if, again, go read accident reports of guys that are just out in the traffic pattern that are just doing standard flying, not talking aerobatics. And I guarantee you that half those accidents, in, they start or end with a stall. Okay. So it's the pilot's ability to control that stall. So therefore we need to know when the aircraft is going to stall. And again, nose high or nose low, it can stall at any attitude. It can stall, um, you know, bank at extreme bank. It can stall straight and level. It doesn't matter. And uh, aircraft can actually stall when it's inverted. 
Okay, it makes no difference the attitude of the aircraft. Um, we're also talking about spins, and uh, if you haven't taken spin training, I highly recommend it. It's a requirement before you come to aerobatics with us out here. Uh, the reason for that is that to, to perform aerobatics, to, to get good in your stick and rudder skills, you have to be comfortable spinning the airplane. Uh, spin is a natural state for the aircraft. It's a, it's a controlled and positively stable uh, state for the aircraft. Once you're in a spin, although from the ground it looks like the aircraft's tumbling out of control, gonna, you know, uh, like the pilot has no ability to control the aircraft, it's in a very stabilized, high, uh, you know, although it's a high rotation, it's stable. And the aircraft will remain in that state until the pilot tells it to do something else. So when we're up and we're performing aerobatic maneuvers and we're trying these new maneuvers and we're in unusual attitudes that we're not used to being in and we don't get it right the first time, which I guarantee you will happen, what do we, what do, we do to recover when, we, when things don't go out the way we planned? Well, the first option, the first and probably the best option we have many times is to just put the aircraft into a spin, Okay. Just just because that's a, that's a situation that if we've already had the training, we're very familiar with. We know that's a positively stable situation. So if we fall out of the loop on the top and we're kind of out of control, we can just pull back on the stick, kick the rudder, initiate a spin. And all of a sudden, the aircraft goes from being in an unusual attitude to a, you know, a position that you're unfamiliar with, that you're not, you, you know, you've not been in this attitude, seeing the aircraft nose upside down in that way. And then all of a sudden, we drop into a, into a spin. Well, now we're in a situation that we know we're comfortable with and we know how to recover from. So we initiate the spin recovery, pull out of the dive and go up and try it again. So that's a very safe and effective method of recovering the aircraft from a situation that you were not comfortable with or not familiar with. So your ability to recognize a spin entry and, and initiate a spin recovery is very, very important. Um, now, the next thing we're talking about is coordination. If what you're seeing on the video here looks at all familiar, you really need to seek some additional training. Uh, and that is because uh, what's happening here is the pilot's inability to coordinate the airplane and control the yaw. Okay. If you'll uh, note on the side here, I wrote the pilot's ability to control yaw is one of the fundamental components of flying, yet it's the least taught uh, or least emphasized skill in today's flight training. Okay. And that's incredibly true, unfortunately. No one teaches a new pilot today how to control yaw. They say there's pedals down there. They, they, you know, sometimes they, they'll help, they, the brakes are down there. Otherwise, you got to kick them a lot when you take off and when you land. Otherwise, you can, you know, don't worry about it. Just push and pull this thing up in front of you. And that's really, I mean, you know, I'm being a little sarcastic with it, but really, truly, that's what is taught in, from your average, uh, to your average student today. And that's not good in the fact that, that remember I said there were two things that a pilot must do all the time. That if he doesn't, as long as he, you know, can maintain or manage these two things that he won't have an issue. Number one, don't stall. Second one, control yaw. So if you can control the yaw and you don't stall the airplane, there's not really a whole lot else that's going to go wrong. Uh, as far as, you know, your, your average, uh, flight. So basically, in our training, in, in prepping for aerobatic training, what we're trying to do, we're trying to achieve a level of competency with the pilot from your basically stick and rudder skills. That means your ability to control roll, pitch, and yaw, all coordinated, all together, all the time, at any attitude, under any condition, slow speed, high speed, doesn't matter. And again, that's, that's a fundamental part of what we will be doing when we initiate aerobatic training. That's the whole concept of it. Um, once you have your, a, a really good feel on that, that's when we can then move into actually performing rolls and loops and all the other fun maneuvers, you know, and at that point, you'll be so confident with the airplane that the thought of doing a loop and roll when it might have been kind of a nervous, scary thing before, you'll think, well, heck, that's nothing compared to what I've already been through, you know, it's, it, and they really are very easy. So um, before we go on, is everybody else getting warm? Is it good in here? Are we temperature good? Okay, awesome. Last time it got a little warm when we were we had a little bigger crowd too. But um, physiological effects. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what it's got, what's going to happen to a person when they experience this type of training, this advanced training. Um, you've already experienced this on a very very small basic level, but we're going to feel a little more of this effect as we do the advanced training. And the first thing we're going to notice is that we experience a higher G loading. 
Now, Gs are what we refer to as our as the effect of centrif centrifugal force on the aircraft as we go through particular maneuvers. It's the feeling of pushing or pulling you in or out of your seat or side to side or front and back. Um, you're familiar with experiencing Gs when you drive your car and you hammer around the corner a little faster than what the speed limit was supposed to be and you feel that pull to the outside or inside of your car. That feeling is Gs. It's the, it's the gravitational force pulling you in or out of your seat side to side. If, you're in, if you go out and ride with Brian in his uh, sports car out there in the parking lot and he takes it out down the runway and just punches it, that acceleration and you feel getting put back in your seat, that's another effect of Gs. That's on a particular axis. Um, if we look at the way we kind of break this down, we've these different roles, these different uh, forces, they're all applied in, in three different axes. So we have the X, Y, and Z axis. The acceleration that I was just talking about would be along the X axis, okay? Um, and acceleration would push you back, coming, you know, basically from your front side to your back side, pushing you backward. Um, you can be accelerated the wrong way if you just sit, just turn yourself around in the car and you're going to feel the acceleration physically on your body in the reverse. Uh, the car going around the corner, that's going to be in the Y axis. Um, that's side to side. And as a pilot, you've all experienced this on some level if you've done a steep turn of any sort. Um, and you've experienced G's in the Z axis, head and toe. And maybe if your instructor was playing around that you've experienced it from toe to head, the reverse. Okay. Now we break this into two categories, positive and negative G's. Positive G's are, like I said, that go from your, from your head to your toe. Those are positive G's. It takes the blood and forces the blood out of your head to your feet. And an extreme version of this can have effects on, a, on you know, physiological effects. Um, the reverse effect, negative G's go from the toe to your head. So the blood is forced to your head. Okay. Now, the corresponding effects, um, like I said, can, um, can be anywhere from just minor, you know, kind of feel kind of funny up to it can kill you if you, get, if you experience too much. The average person is going to experience, can, can withstand about four positive Gs before they start to experience uh, what we would consider uh, major side effects. Okay, and they can experience negative two Gs. So notice we can take a lot more positive Gs than we can negative Gs. And the reason for that is that our, right now we're all sitting upright and gravity is working from our head to our toe, pulling us, keeping your feet on the floor. And so our bodies are designed to withstand positive Gs. You put someone and hang them from their feet and they won't last more than a minute or two before they're getting red in the face and lightheaded and wanting to wanting let go, you know. Uh, so we're designed to take positive Gs. Now, on our chart over here, you'll notice that I've broken down different categories for flight categories of aircraft. For your standard normal category aircraft, they can withstand, they're designed, the aircraft itself is designed to withstand 3.8 positive Gs and negative 1.52, okay? Um, that's for a normal category. That's your 172, your Archers, your J3 Cubs, your standard aircraft. If you move to the aerobatic flight envelope, the aerobatic category, okay, it's another special, it's, it's an airworthy, everything's category. The aerobatic category, they're rated to positive six, negative three. So we're expanding that flight envelope. The aircraft are built stronger, tougher. And again, note even the aircraft are designed to withstand higher positive G loads than, than negative G loads. That's important to remember because we don't want to exceed uh, our G loading at any point, but especially since we, we know we can go positive six, we don't want to misinterpret and think we can go negative six. Okay, it's not a balanced out issue. And uh, another thing to note right now, as we're all sitting here, how many Gs are we experiencing right now? One G, right? Not zero. We don't start at zero. We start at one. This is one positive uh, G. So it's, it's the force of gravity as it is sitting on Earth. When we double that force, then we go to two Gs. So... If a person sitting in the room weighs 150 pounds and all of a sudden is exposed to two Gs, while they're exposed to two Gs, the, the effect that they're going to experience or feel is that they weigh 300 pounds, twice their body weight. Okay? So if we all of a sudden pull six Gs, okay, that person is going to weigh you know, exponential weight and it's going to be incredibly difficult for them to move. Um, and there's a lot of examples in this with uh, fighter pilots 
uh, astronauts that go into space when they launch off the in the rocket in the you know shuttles and the rockets that the g loading that they experience so they have to train for that um, and of course the unlimited category uh, this is not an aerodynamics category this is a aerobatic it's kind of an, known in the aerobatic community as just a category of competition but I wanted to include that as just a, to give you an example there are aircraft that are designed basically for what we call unlimited competition, which means they can do whatever they want to do. Any maneuver is free game, any, anything. And they're typically, most of these aircraft are designed for 8, 9, 10, and most of them are positive 12 to negative 12 Gs. That's what the aircraft is designed for. Okay. Now, we said that most human beings are going to start to have bad effects happen at 4 Gs. The aircraft can go three times that strong. Um, you'll find out that a, a, the average human, when you're, when you're trained up for, to be exposed to the, the G effect, can withstand more than four. You know, most people can go a lot higher. In fact, some of your, your high-level competition aerobatic pilots will experience um, up to 12 Gs. They have aircraft that are rated even higher than that, um, believe it or not. But basically, they're rated so high that you can't break the airplane. You're going to hurt yourself or, you know, uh, you're going to hurt yourself first, basically. So uh, you, don't, you don't have to worry about breaking the airplane. But um, some pilots during maneuvers for just a brief second will experience up to 12 Gs. Um, like Sean Tucker, you saw the aircraft we were comparing before with Sean Tucker's uh, biplane. And he's been known, supposedly, to set a record at, at uh, positive 14 Gs for, for a split second. We're not talking for, for just a fraction of a second, but it, I mean, you still feel it, but it's not sustained. Um, if you were to sustain that that G loading for more than even just a few seconds, it would it would not only knock him out, it could kill him. It would stop all blood flow to his his extremities and brain, and and could kill him. Um, so these are quick movements. When you take an aircraft and you violently pitch it up from a horizontal attitude to vertical attitude in just a matter of a split second, that high G loading is just a temporary thing. So I want to kind of step back when we're doing our training. We're not going to go pull 12 Gs, okay? The Cetabria, we'll, we'll, we will break the airplane at that point. Um, but what we're going to experience is anywhere from 2 to 3 Gs, maybe a little 3.5 Gs on the positive side. And we, we, do, we do not fly negative Gs in this particular aircraft. Advanced aerobatic training, you'll start flying negative inverted maneuvers. But uh, the most you'll experience is going weightless, going to 0 Gs. That's weightless, okay? You will experience that. <coughs> but otherwise, we're only going 2 to 3 times our... By the way, two to two to three Gs. The average human being has no problem saying that. It takes a little bit to get used to the feeling. It's going to feel a little unusual. It's just like a thrill ride when you go on a roller coaster and you kind of get that feeling put in your seat. It's it's just like that, maybe slightly more, but that's it. So it's very very easy, and uh, there's no harm to the aircraft. Even a normal category aircraft can withstand that, and we're in an aerobatic aircraft that's able to withstand twice as much. So. Um, some of the effects that we can experience if we do exceed. Um, that 4G, um, dirt, while you're experiencing the G loading, if you're under a sustained 3G pull where you're continuously, you're holding 3Gs for, you know, four or five, six seconds, uh, you can experience tunnel vision and that'll lead to a gray out where your vision gets, you know, tight where you can only see out of a pinhole and uh, gray out is where you start to actually just see gray. If, you, if that G loading increases or continues beyond just a few seconds, and you typically three to four seconds. After about four seconds of sustained three Gs, you will then experience a blackout. Well, the average human can't withstand more than that without blacking out. And uh, beyond that, if they kept kept it going, eventually you would lose consciousness. And if the G loading was high enough, you could it could kill you again, like we said. But that's with extreme high G loadings. But the average person, worst case scenario, you you could black out if they pulled hard enough Gs for a long enough time. But again, you have to sit there and just keep pulling G's all the time. Uh, that's not what we do in the standard aerobatic training. And the effects afterwards, they can give you a headache, make you dizzy, um, you know, kind of get you upset stomach. Um, and some people, it does give them vertigo if, you, if you're doing an extreme. Now, again, when we do our training, we work into this. We don't start just pulling three G's. We're going to work into it. And, and again, the G loading that we're working with is not going to be uh, too extreme to where it's going to affect you that bad. It's, you're, the effects aren't going to be any worse than riding a roller coaster 10 times in a row. You, you might get a little sick after riding it 10 times in a row, but that's about it. And we, we stop when the, when the student wants to stop. We're not going to make you go beyond it. And we also set our structure. We structure the course so that um, 
you're not going to get sick. We don't want you to get sick. We want you to have fun when you're flying. So if you're coming back with a headache and feeling nauseous, that's not good. We don't want that. So um, I want to give you a demonstration of uh, the effects of G's. This is taken from a video produced here a couple years back called Speed and Angels. And it's just a little expert from that. Say your head weighs 10 pounds. That means if you pull nine Gs, that means your head now weighs 90 pounds. There's that force is transmitted throughout your whole body. And what happens is the blood will tend to flow away from your brain. When you get catapulted off the boat, you'll get Gs in the x-axis going this way. It's not the same. When the race car driver's taking all their Gs, it's Gs in the z-axis. It's not Gs coming down through the y-axis, which run the risk of knocking you out. Ease a little. Anything. <laughs> you with me, man? Yeah. Why are you sleeping on me, dog? <laughs> 380. Geez, here's how you pull geez. If you're short, apparently the distance from your heart to your head makes it so your heart can keep the blood in your head a little bit easier so you can pull more geez. And definitely being stockier helps. Tall, skinny guys that run and have low blood pressure, they'll pass right out doing G's. Short, fat guys that eat a lot of red meat and drink a lot of beer with high blood pressure, man, you don't even have to strain at all. You just pull and you're like, it's nothing. Nothing at all. Coming out of it. Good night. Sweet heart. Good night. Hey, brother. I gotta get you on a lock clock back there. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a good example of uh, that was he was riding along with the uh, Blue Angels and an F-18 Hornet, and uh, he was a pilot himself, but he was not used to ex being exposed to that high of G loading, and they were pulling much more than your four or five. They were pulling six, seven, eight Gs. So the difference there is obviously it must just be the technique that the, the pilot was using to stay away in this. Muscle contractions and whatever they, they it's to to um, correct. That's some of it. Um, most of it though is actually just conditioning uh, and tolerance, tolerance buildup. Um, if a pilot goes and flies a aerobatic routine day in and day out for you know practices three four times a week for three months straight, they're going to be able to pull the maximum amount you know that they're at the, the, when they're at their peak at their best. And then if they don't fly for three months. Even if they don't fly for one month and they go back and do the exact same routine they did a month ago, they'll be graying out, blacking out, having lots of trouble maintaining that same thing. So it's, it's, you have to stay at it. It's a skill that it's not one of those things that once you have the skill that you retain the skill, you're going to lose that ability after a while. So you want to keep that by practicing repeatedly. You know, that's just very, very important. So, um, and then, oops, I don't want to watch that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the parachutes. Um, you'll notice we've got a couple of them up here. And basically, this is just a safety measure that we wear um, when we're doing the aerobatics. These are reserve chutes. They're not standards. They're not, this is not what you're going to go jump out of the airplane with. This is simply in case we had a, a structural failure of the aircraft, if we had an issue that, that uh, the engine quit on us, or if there was something that we decided we needed to bail out of the aircraft, this is just an emergency reserve chute. There's no, there is no reserve. Like a normal uh, person jumping out has their primary chute and then a reserve chute. We just have a reserve chute. So it's a one pull done deal. There's no steering it. There's no nothing. It's just going to keep you from hitting the ground really, really hard. You'll just hit it kind of hard. So um, that's the whole point of it. Now this style, you'll notice on the left side of the picture, these are the backpack style. So they're really skinny and uh, they're meant to you know wear on your back and that way you can uh, keep it in the aircraft. We don't have a lot of room in there, so we can't be wearing the big packs that they wear when they skydive. Um, the other alternative is a seat style, and uh, that's where the, the pack is actually underneath of you and you sit on it. A lot of times uh, when there's a restriction on, on forward and backward and the lateral, um, not lateral, but just the between you and the control stick of the aircraft, that's where, um, that's where you'll use the backpack style to put underneath of you as long as you don't have 
head clearance issues either. So depending on your aircraft, you'll use the different styles. Some guys prefer it one way or the other, just whatever's comfortable for you too. Um, you know, we can fit them in the Satabri, just wearing the backpack styles. Occasionally, if we got to get it's a little bit bigger, we'll have to take the cushion off the back of the seat just to make room. Um, but again, that's just what we, we wear them just in case of an emergency. One of the things, one of the things that you want to do um, when you're wearing these, uh, practice every time, just like we go up and we practice to do our maneuvers, you should practice your emergency procedures as well. Um, it's kind of a common procedure. Um, I know some guys that every single time they get out of the aircraft, they get out by bailing out, by, by mock bailing out. They get down, they shut the aircraft down, do their after landing checks and, and securing the airplane. And then when they get out, now they can't pull the hinge pin on the door and, and bust the door off, have it fall on the ground and then jump out. But they will practice the, in, in, the, in a slow sequence of headset off, unbuckle, you know, stand up and grabbing whatever they're going to grab to hold on to and then making the motion to, to get out just so that it becomes habit so that when they need to do it, they're not having to go, okay, uh, you know, what do I do here? It's just a, just get out just like anything else. So, um, you guys have any questions on the parachutes? It's just something I mean, when you, when you actually start the training, we go into a lot more detail on, on when you wear them, how to deploy it and everything. It's very, very simple. Um, it's not complicated like your other shoots. All it is is there's one handle here, and basically all you got to remember is when you get out of the airplane, just yank that handle out, and that's all. It'll do the rest. You know, very, very simple. So just safety precaution. Um, when I give rides, um, everybody's really excited and pumped up and just thrilled to be doing an aerobatic ride, and as soon as they walk up to the airplane, I hand them this, and they go, what's that? And I go, it's your parachute. And then they realize I'm not joking. All of a sudden, they kind of get a little more serious, you know. But uh, it's just there as a backup. So if you want to take a, little, take a look at those afterwards, feel free. Um, any other questions on the parachute? So let's talk about some basic maneuvers. Now that we're, we've got our skills developed and we're ready to begin doing some actual aerobatic maneuvers, um, you're going to find out that all aerobatic maneuvers, everything you see an air show pilot doing, a uh, fighter jet pilot doing, they're all fundamental maneuvers that are just branched off of, of two, basically two basic maneuvers. The first basic maneuver is a loop. Okay. And a loop is initiated by taking the aircraft. Uh, you have to get to an appropriate entry speed, have enough speed to, to perform the maneuver. And the pilot's going to pitch up in a hard pull. And this is typically anywhere from three to four G's. And depending on the aircraft, it can be as low as two, uh, but you got to have a lot of speed, a lot of power. So if the less power you have, the more you're going to have to pull the aircraft through the maneuver. So we're going to enter at about a 3G pull up to the vertical, and you're just going to keep pulling on the stick the whole time. Um, when you get really advanced and you want to make a nice pretty loop that actually looks like a loop, then you'll, we'll start teaching you how to exaggerate the top um, to, to actually make it look like that. But most of your loops are going to be kind of egg-shaped where you just go up and back down. It's not going to be this nice big rounded loop. To do that, again, you have to do some additional things on the top of the loop. So the aircraft just goes around. And then on the downhill side, the pilot's starting to pull the power back to idle. Just so we don't pick up too much speed coming up the bottom. And just brings it right back around out the bottom. And you should be basically, if you do it right, you're at the exact same altitude and the exact same airspeed when you come back out. So you'll go from entry speed at nearly uh, 140 mile an hour. And as you're at the uh, uh, top there, you'll be about 40 mile an hour. You'll be basically stalled out or just above a stall, depending on the aircraft and what you're doing. So you go from one extreme to the other to, to get the most altitude gain. You're tra trading all that airspeed for altitude. So that's the first basic uh, maneuver. <coughs> the second one is a roll. Uh, in particular, we're going to use an example of an aileron roll. There's many different types of rolls, as, if, as there are also many types of loops. We'll go through some of those in a little bit, but basically... Your aileron roll is where we're going to roll the aircraft around the uh, longitudinal axis. Okay, so using the the stick, the ailerons, it's just a we call it aileron roll because you use the ailerons. So you start the aircraft again at an appropriate entry speed. Usually it's a little less than the, than the loop. We don't have to have quite as much speed. We're going to pitch the aircraft nose up, and we're going to begin to roll the aircraft around the longitudinal axis. It goes up and around. At halfway through the loop, you'll be completely inverted, and you'll keep the roll. It's one continuous roll back out and then back. To straight level flight. The aircraft will go up and around. This is a 1G maneuver. 1G maneuver. Okay. There should be 
maybe 1.2, 1.3, okay, for the initial just to pull up. But if you, when you get really good at it, this should not feel any different than you sitting in your seat right now. Even though you're going upside down, if you close your eyes, you wouldn't know that I rolled the airplane. You'd have no idea. You wouldn't feel any different. So again, we're talking recreational aerobatics. The old, the old name for it was gentleman's aerobatics. It's, it's very light, low G maneuvers that are meant to just develop your ability to fly the aircraft through an extreme attitude, but we're not doing anything crazy with the airplane. It's all within the aircraft's standard flight envelope. Any questions on these two maneuvers? Uh, another uh, set of maneuvers, now we're going to start to, and this is there's kind of a third, and we call them lines. Um, so we have a horizontal or a vertical line. And to give you an example of that, I'm going to show you a hammerhead. And this is where we're going to take the aircraft, and we're going to put it on a vertical up line. So we're going to accelerate to an appropriate entry speed. We uh, pitch the aircraft straight vertical, and we hold the aircraft straight vertical. It goes up right to a stall, and right before you stall, you flip the aircraft over with the use of the rudder. You just flip the rudder and the aircraft flips over and then it will just shoot down and back out. Now for competition, uh, you actually have to bring the aircraft back down from the entry altitude, lower than your entry altitude. Um, there's different combinations. Sometimes if, depending on how the maneuver is written for what you're supposed to be doing, sometimes you have to go up and come down and come out above where you started or the same altitude where you started or below. Typically below where you started is where you come out at. Um, when we practice these maneuvers, um, the benefit is that when we actually start with these, this is, these are the first three sets of maneuvers that we start with. And the reason for that is that by doing the hammerhead, you actually get the experience, um, that attitude being straight vertical, which for most people, that's just not normal. Obviously would be flying straight up in an airplane. Um, but it develops your ability to learn that the aircraft can, 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 you can be in this attitude. It's perfectly safe but also to develop your ability to then look around the aircraft in an unusual attitude and not get disoriented. Because typically, as soon as you go out of your normal within 30 degrees of roll and 30 degrees of pitch, most people start to kind of lose where they're at around the horizon because they're just not used to, you know, uh, seeing that from inside the airplane. So it allows you to get that at the sight picture, um, feel the, the control pressures necessary to bring the aircraft into a nose high attitude, Again, we're working from a high entry speed to an absolutely slow, minimum controllable airspeed. Um, so you get to work all speed ranges, which is why it's so critical that we learn to control that in the basic fundamental parts of the flying, that you learn to control uh, low to high speed. And it's just absolutely fun um, flying straight up and then coming looking straight back down at the ground. It, typically, that's you know, people think that's the wrong thing to be doing in the airplane, but when you realize that you ha still have controllability of the aircraft all the way through this entire maneuver, and we can pull out above, on the line, or below the line. We can do it whatever we want. Um, when you start getting really advanced, what we'll start doing, you'll see pilots do this. There's multiple things we can do at the top of the maneuver. We can do your standard hammerhead where you just go up and the aircraft just pivots around and comes down. We can take the aircraft and flip it over on its back and come down. We can do a front where we come up and then push over the top. We can also uh, do it where we come straight back down. I call the tail slide where you slide. You, you don't change the attitude. You just slide back through the tail. Do not try that in your aircraft for any reason whatsoever. Most aircraft are not rated to be doing that. Uh, that changes control pressures on the, on the tail. But uh, the advanced aerobatic airplanes can do that, and it looks really cool, especially if they have the smoke. They'll go right back down through their own smoke. It's a nice show effect. So um, the other thing is, 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 again, it's all combinations of, of loops, rolls, and lines. Okay, And so we have a line. Can we do a roll? Sure we can. On the down line, we can take the aircraft, and roll at 90, 180, 270, or 360 degrees, and then pull out where, whichever way we want. So if we want to change our direction, if we enter this way, typically we'd come around and come back out the same way we came in, the, the opposite of the way we came in. But if we could uh, change it so that we rotate and then come out this way, or this way, or whichever way we want. So when you start getting into competition, they'll have them set up different ways so that you remain within a certain perimeter, a certain box, an aerobatic box, as you do your competition, but that's one way that they can control the aircraft to keep it inside that. They can change the position. That's kind of some advanced, but notice it's all combinations of the loop, roll, and the line. Uh, final uh, basic maneuver is uh, basically it's two and one. We're going to see the one version of it here, and this is called the split S. Uh, you may have heard pilots talk about this. A lot of times, this is where this is the one maneuver that gets pilots in a lot of trouble. Um, you're out flying around. Uh, maybe you're 
departing off of a runway at a big airport and you departed behind a big jet and the controller didn't give enough spacing and you hit his wake turbulence. Okay. Flips the aircraft upside down. Okay. And you're fairly low altitude. Now, typical response from the pilot is to split us out. Okay. And I'll show you the maneuver. Basically what it is is we're going to roll the airplane upside down and then pull through the vertical back out in the opposite direction, just like that. Now, if you're at 500 feet and you get flipped upside down, that's not the right maneuver to do. Yet that's the instinctive initial reaction of every pilot that has not been trained to fly any sort of aerobatics or any advanced flight training. Just natural, instinctive, save your butt response is to pull back to bring the airplane back out, okay? That's just what we're taught. It's just part of human nature to the response. So part of the uh, aerobatic training is to teach you to do the proper maneuvers as necessary. So this is where we're getting to the, the emergency procedures and how aerobatics will help you in an emergency situation to know what to do and how to respond. The proper thing to do, because now that we know that we can just roll that airplane all the way around, no problem, even a 172, your basic Cessna 172, you can aileron roll that, no problem. And especially if you if this happens at 500 foot, you can roll that thing right back out and keep on flying. You might come out 300 foot above the ground, but you're, you're flying, you're straight level, everything's fine, instead of nosing straight into the ground and you're all dead, okay? Because that's what's going to happen there every single time. There's no way around it. So um, this is the split S maneuver. Now, this is an intentional maneuver we can do when we have an appropriate altitude and we want to uh, practice this maneuver. This is a combination. The, the alternative to this is called the Immelman. And basically, it's where you would reverse it and you start low or you just start at an altitude and you basically pull up through the vertical through a half loop and then roll out on the top and keep going the opposite direction. Um, that was built by Max Immelman back in World War One. That was he was kind of known as the first guy to develop an aerobatic maneuver, and that was the Immelman. And basically, he did that to get away from uh, the other enemy aircraft. If someone was chasing him, he would uh, dive for speed, and then all of a sudden just pull up, leaving them going this way. And he'd roll out and go the opposite direction. And and then actually, he de later on developed a way to then take that, and he could actually split S and come back behind them. And now he's got them in front and could shoot him down. So um, that's why it's called the Immelman because uh, Max Immelman develop, developed it. And this is the same maneuver. It's just a reverse. Well, you go, you go over. Um, you can do this. Notice I have us do a half roll first and then pull through. So when we come out, we're upright. The alternative is to go straight level and just push outside, do an outside loop and you come out inverted. That's an advanced version of it. You know, that one doesn't feel quite as fun to do. You push in a lot of negative G's. So um, those are your, some of your basic maneuvers. Um, on your advanced maneuvers here, we're going to, these are a list of just some of the, just some of the first ones that, that you would see the average typical maneuvers that you're going to see at an air show. Uh, notice they're all rolls, loops, and then other is basically combinations of it, of, of those two or line maneuvers. On the roll side, we have an aileron roll, barrel roll, snap roll, slow roll, hesitation roll, point roll. There, there's all different types of rolls. And they're all variations of the same thing. The aircraft is just going around its longitudinal axis. Uh, depending on your aircraft and what your aircraft's performance is capable of depends on what you can do. Okay. Um, certain aircraft can't handle doing a point roll, a hesitation roll, where we stop the aircraft every 90 degrees and, and hesitate just momentarily on that, on that heading. So I don't know if you're going to do this Yep. Yep. Correct. And that's, that's a good thing to bring up because it is um, very commonly misunderstood. A barrel roll is your, your classic 1G maneuver. That's, that's what I mentioned earlier, Bob Hoover did every time he took off in his airplane, uh, any airplane. And that's because it is a 1G maneuver. Air, every aircraft can do it. And that a barrel roll is going to look like you're, you're flying the airplane through the inside of a barrel. It's going to look like this. It's going to curve around and out. Okay. So you start in a, you bank the airplane into a nose low dive off to one side. So if you're, if you're heading this way, you would turn the aircraft and dive this way, dive down into your left or right, whichever way, and then pitch up. And as you're, as you're pulling up, you're also rolling the aircraft. So it's a combination roll and a loop. Cause if you actually look at it, you actually do a loop and you also do a full roll at the same time. It's a combination of the two, um, which is, why we actually don't start with a barrel roll, even though it's the, like, quote unquote, the easiest maneuver and it's for the air, aircraft to do. It's a 1G maneuver. It's very simple. 
you're actually having to do two things in one. And that's a lot more complicated than just doing one loop or one roll. So it's an advanced maneuver. Now the difference between the barrel roll and the aileron roll is that the aileron roll technically should be um, perfectly level. So the aircraft should fly straight and level and should just roll exactly along its uh, longitudinal axis. Okay, so it's 1G, but not always up to bottom. Like, well, the reason... always towards the ground, basically. So you'll experience like 1G normal and then 1G to the side, 1G up to the top. Correct, correct, yep, yep. Whereas the barrel roll, you're always doing one... One positive G all the time, because you're always pulling through. So even though you're upside down, it's still pulling you into your seat and it's still going around. So um, now... The reason that we can go do an, an aileron roll in Satabri, and I'm telling you that it, you'd feel just like you're sitting in your seat, is you'll notice um, that I pitched up. The aircraft went up and then rolled over. So essentially, I'm doing a really sloppy barrel roll and a, or a really sloppy aileron roll. It's like half, it's a half and half. And the reason for that is so that, again, we don't have to experience the negative 1G, okay, because our aircraft does not have inverted fuel and oil. And therefore, as soon as we experience one negative G, all fuel stops flowing to the engine and the engine quits. And that may not bother me, but it definitely bothers the student. <laughs> so um, we, don't, we don't like to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll dive for some speed and we'll pitch up and then roll the aircraft around. And, and as we're doing that, that motion, it allows us to keep some positive Gs on the aircraft the entire time. The, the proper one, if you go to a contest and do that, they'll be slapping you on the wrist and yelling at you because um, technically they, when they watch it, they should, the aircraft nose should not pitch up. They should see it just perfectly straight across as it rolls. So um, that's the difference. And we kind of combine them when we're doing our training. So um, I want to show you <coughs> um, just real quick, the loops. There's lots of different ones. You have a square loop where you'll see actually square sides, um, diamond loop where they go up on a diamond, just, just take that square and tip it 90 degrees, uh, 45 degrees. Um, you know, the, the element is a half loop up the split s is a half loop down uh p loops q loops y loops those are all just different shapes of loops um there's a lot of uh um, combinations and the others we already saw the hammerhead and basically combinations of that the tail slide different ones do note that there are a couple maneuvers um which are which are not technically considered aerobatic maneuvers but they are prep maneuvers for aerobatics and we'll perform these when we're doing our initial primary training and they're basically commercial maneuvers so you have your Chandel and your Lazy 8. Uh, an extreme version of the Lazy 8 is the wing over. That's the aerobatic version, okay? Because you actually do go over 60 degrees of bank, whereas in the, in the Lazy 8, you should not exceed 60 degrees. So that's the, that's the difference. One's an FAA standard maneuver. The other one is a considered aerobatic. So um, last thing I want to show you here on the, on the advanced figures, uh, you'll notice under the rolls there's a slow roll, and then there's a super slow roll, okay? The super slow roll, um, I don't know who invented it. Um, there, there's a lot of people who'd probably take credit for inventing it, but basically the slow roll is just an aileron roll, but it's slow. So they just go very, very slow around. And the super slow roll is super slow. And I can tell you to do a super slow roll takes incredible coordination from the pilot. The, the aircraft, as long as it has sufficient power, will have no problem doing that as long as you have enough energy, but to coordinate that because you're having to push, roll, and yaw the aircraft continuously in all the different directions all the time. So as you get to the first 90 degrees, you have to use top rudder, right rudder in this case, and then as you start to really to push the stick, okay, and then you're transitioning to left rudder, and then here you're going to left rudder, and now you're uh, transitioning, you're still rolling the airplane, and then as you come back around, you're having to pull back on the stick and transition from left and right rudder, and there's a whole... It's a very complicated maneuver to perform. So uh, I wanted to give you an example of that. Um, before you watch the video, you'll see John Moore. He no longer, he just retired, I think, last year. But he's flying a stock uh, Boeing Stearman biplane, a uh, classic Stearman. You'll see the airplane. You'll, I'm sure you've seen one like it before um, on TV. But the aircraft um, is not rated for inverted maneuvers. So when he goes upside down after a period of time, especially when he's doing a super slow roll after he stays upside down for a period of time, it runs out of gas and it will backfire and it's at a radial engine. So it's a different style engine than what you're typically going to be flying. 
And because of that, the exhaust stack is out the side and you'll see it actually backfire and you'll see the, the flame blow out the, the exhaust and it's just kind of a neat effect. It's supposed to happen. So it's part of his exciting routine. For any extended period of time. So frequently when he holds it in the inverted, that fuel will build up in there and you'll hear that airplane backfire and a great big stream of fire will come out of it. But don't worry, that's all part of it. Coming back in to show some... Looks a whole lot easier. There it is. Don't be frightened. That's okay. The super slow roll. And notice how, how incredibly slow that roll was. And he was right on, you know, heading. And uh, what he did, you'll, you saw him dive down and, and roll up and over. And he, he did a half Cuban, which is a half roll. Uh, actually, it's a five eighths. You come over five eighths and then you roll out down line. And that was just to pick up enough speed that when he pulled out, he had enough speed to get him through that maneuver since he's doing it at 200 feet above the ground. So, um, and then notice the smoke stopped right when it backfired. That's because you know it backfired, so it basically temporarily caused the smoke to stop uh, coming out the exhaust because the fire was blowing out the exhaust. So that's always kind of fun to watch. Um, so basically, where we're at with the aerobatics is just want to go through some different applications of how we can actually take these aerobatics and how when you after you do the training, what can you go do with it? Is it just to build the skill, or can you actually use and use this for any purpose? Um, number one, advanced flight training. You know, obviously we go out and we get the skills. We build that ability to fly the aircraft through any flight envelope and, uh, and have fun doing it, uh, increasing your skill and building your confidence up, you know, for the pilots that want to go fly their aircraft on stronger, windier days or, uh, into shorter and shorter, tighter grass strips and things like that. This will help. It helps in every aspect of your flight training, every, every part of your flying. So after you do the training, if you decide, hey, that was kind of fun, I kind of liked going upside down, I want to do some more of that, and maybe you have an aircraft that is aerobatic, or you can rent one locally, or you decide you're going to go buy yourself an a, a aerobatic-capable aircraft, which there are many of those, all your RVs, all your, uh, many of the experimentals out there now, the home-built experimentals are all aerobatic. You can go buy a Pitts, a high-end, you know, actually a Pitts you can buy for, you know, eighteen thousand dollars, you can buy yourself a cheap little single seat pits that'll go do all sorts of fun stuff. You know, much more than what we've talked about in the advanced stuff or the the basic. But it's recreational aerobatics. Again, we're just doing basic loops and rolls. You go out on a nice day like today, go up high. Maybe you got a buddy who likes to go with you. you strap your parachutes on. You go out and you just 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 keep current, stay current, have fun with it, enjoy what you're doing. And uh, you know, maybe you and a couple buddies go out, and maybe that leads to you end up doing formation flying and different things like that, you know, uh, kind of sharing that hobby with other people. So if you really, really like it and you want to keep moving, you can move on to competition aerobatics where we're going to start, we're going to confine the space in which you can do this and we're going to start making those maneuvers. We're going to tighten them up to where they have to meet a certain standard. They have to look a certain level and, and you have to perform to a certain uh, criteria while you're being judged from the ground on how well you do. Uh, competition aerobatics, although it sounds like it's, it's a competition, it's much more rigid it's a ton of fun. It's not really, there's competition aerobatics and then there's competition aerobatics, like the hardcore guys, you know, uh, if you want to go out and compete in the U S nationals, that's a whole different ball game than what we're talking about for basic local competitions. Um, and there are many aerobatic competitions. If you don't want to compete, I suggest you go, you actually attend a local competition. Um, they have them out in Spencer. There's one up in Oshkosh. Um, there's some in Illinois and we're hoping to get one maybe going around here locally pretty soon. Um, they're just a ton of fun to watch. So even if you're fine with keeping your airplane upright and level, uh, maybe an occasional loop, go watch some other guys and watch how well they do because this is the epitome of perfection in flight training. They will do their maneuvers perfectly to the point where a loop looks exactly like a loop. The rolls are exactly on angle, on heading, on altitude, everything. And it's just a ton of fun to watch. So that's the extreme. And then for the guys that have been doing competition for a long time, they'll get into the air show circuit. That's how you quote unquote recoup your costs from all the days you spent paying to go to competitions and all the gas money you wasted doing that. Um, so if you want to do air shows, that's going to take years and years of competition practice, but it, you know, it's not impossible to do. So um, I want to show you an example. Um, this pilot is uh, her name is Svetlana Kapanina. She's a Russian uh, top world aerobatic performer. And she's going to do a two-part show here. It's about a four-minute video. 
the first two minutes or so, she's going to be doing a, a standard routine that was she, it's written out and it's published. It's part of a competition that she was competing in. I think she got, I think it says she got third place in the video um, for this contest. This was just a year or two ago. And uh, so they have what they call a known sequence where they publish and they say, you're going to do a loop, then a roll, then a roll this way. And then, a, you know, they, they give her exact sequence. That's the first two minutes. Second two minutes is a freestyle where she makes up her own routine, not on the fly. She does it preemptively and then comes in. And so it'll be different. So every performer will do their own version of their own, their own freestyle. So um, note the different maneuvers that we've been talking about. You'll see hammerheads, you'll see loops, you'll see rolls, and you'll see some advanced versions where you'll actually, at the very end of the video, if you pay attention, you'll see she's actually going to be rolling the airplane, aileron rolling it, while she's actually making it a 360, like a, a turn, a 360 degree turn, which is incredibly complicated because you're having to keep the aircraft going. It's this, it's try to think that out, you know? <laughs> so, <coughs> um, and watch the perfection because this is, in my opinion, I, the reason I wanted, I picked this video of her flying is her ability to fly the aircraft very, very precisely. I mean, you, if you watch her rolls, it's absolutely perfect. They're, they're dead on. And the only way that you can do that is with perfection in coordination, working the rudders, working the ailerons to know your aircraft and its limits. So. That's the way to wing wag right there. 90 degrees. So that's her. That was her. Okay, this would be the first step. It's still a lot more tired, Scott. Right now, instead of the stable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the 
So there's a good example of a, a known competition and then the freestyle and basically taking the maneuvers and going to an extreme with it. So uh, anybody have any questions? Yeah, Bill. Since you've been into acrobatics, <coughs> have you invented any new maneuvers? Uh, I actually have. I, I actually have. And I haven't found anybody that's told me of any, any maneuver that's actually uh, uh, the same or given it a name already. Um, basically, it, um, I take the aircraft and get it incredibly slow, and I initiate a um, basically a 30 degree bank turn, and then I basically do a half snap inverted, and I can pull out the exact opposite. It's like a half snap to pull out the opposite way. Mm -hmm. uh, Lam Shavak. No, I have not. <laughs> I think the wings would come off the airplane if I tried. What is that? Uh, Lam Shavak is actually, I think, if unless I, I my Russian is not uh, very good, but I'm pretty sure it means uh, drunkard in Russian uh, because the maneuver, uh, to demonstrate what it is, um, the pilot gets the aircraft, it's under power, under full power, and you have to have a very powerful aircraft like what you just saw flying to have enough torque and, and uh, gyroscopic effect from the engine. That's how this maneuver is done. But basically the pilot gets... Uh, gets up into a high angle attack, they will stall the aircraft and kick it. And basically they will end up flipping the aircraft end over end like this while traveling this way. So it'll look, um, it'll look like this. It's a very, yeah, yep. It's at the end over end and it's a crazy maneuver, um, but it's, it's all done with gyroscopic uh, torque from the engine to make it flop over itself and still continue a flight path. And then when they stop it, they basically fall and have to get speed and then dive out again because they're just floating, hanging on the prop, flipping over. So that's a Lam Shavak. So, yeah. Anybody? When you say gyroscopic maneuver, is that just that based on the engine? Yes. Yeah, that's based on the, your gyroscopic effect that you experience. And, you, you know, for a private pilot, you learn about your four torque effects, P-factor, uh, torque, and the engine torque gyroscopic effect and slipstream, that same gyroscopic effect that they talk about, um, the 90 degree pull on the engine, it's the same effect. So if you just have a larger horsepower engine, you know, you're talking to your standard aircraft have 100 to 150 horsepower, you jump to a 300 or 400 horse engine, and yet the aircraft itself weighs even less than the aircraft that we were working with before, uh, the gyroscopic effect is much greater. And therefore, when they're hanging up at a slow airspeed, they can use that effect to turn the airplane around. So that was invented here uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. That became really popular. Um, and again, most of your competition stuff was all invented over in Europe. That's where they do a lot of the competition. So any other questions? All right. I think we'll uh, call it good. So thanks for coming. <laughs>